So welcome to the second seminar of the STAPA 2016 seminar series. Uh, just to remind you that STAPA is the association of young researchers and postdocs of Institut Pasteur. And the aim of this association is to help the integration of students and postdocs to the life of the Institute and in, in, in France in Paris. And so we organize some social activities like the social hour now a cold social hour, <laughs> not beer hour anymore, so a bit too funny things. And also integration events, but so also some scientific events like the seminars, also um, the interdepartmental retreat and others. So the first, uh, uh, the idea of these seminars is to have talks that uh, they're not only about specific data, um, so those talks that are allowed in this too, we, we don't really need more uh, of those ones, I would say. And the idea is that these talks are inspirational, especially for young researchers, for students, and for the others as well. Mm -hmm. and, and so these talks will go from showing the importance of interdisciplinarity to do biomedical research, philosophy of sciences, and also about the role of society in science and vice versa. The first talk was given by uh, Stephen Friend, who is the, the president of Sage Bio Network. It was very well attended, a very nice talk. He, he, told, he told us about the use of uh, uh, smartphone applications to, to do clinical trials. And that was in, uh, interesting and also sort of uh, indicates a, a change in paradigm in, in the way of doing biomedical research. And now uh, I would like to welcome Thomas Actually, Pradil, who is the pronunciation? Pradil, uh, who was very kind and accepting this uh, to, to come here to give us the seminar. Actually, I found I found I found him because he sent a, a, there was an email circulating uh, offering a postdoc in research in philosophy of science, especially in in, in, in microbiota. Something that took my attention because I, I, I was not aware of someone doing that. Also, took my attention that he has a ERC, ERC uh, grant, so I was also not aware that you can get an IRC if you do philosophy of science, it's something even more interesting, and I find it actually very great. And um, what do you do then? <laughs> and, and so he, he, he's now based in, in, in the University of Bordeaux, uh, where he has his group. He's also a CNRS uh, researcher. He also is uh, associated here to the uh, the Institute is top, uh, the philosophy of the science and techniques. Um, and he has written the, in 2012 the book, The Limits of the Self, Immunology and Biological Identity. He also has other publications in, in similar topics, and his topics move between philosophy of biology, philosophy of immunology, the micro, of microbiology development, theoretic, theoretical immunology, philosophy of medicine, of general sciences, um, metaphysics also, science and metaphysics. So now I leave the space to, <laughs> to Thomas to talk and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I had no idea there would be so many people. Uh, and also so many people who are friends of mine, so thank you very much for being here. Uh, the first thing I wanna say is, is for me extremely important. It's that philosophers of science, and philosophers of biology especially, what we try to do is to work with biologists in collaboration with biologists to try to clarify some issues about biology. Some of them are conceptual, maybe. What do you mean by ecosystem? What do you mean by individual? What do you mean by self, et cetera, et cetera. So questions about concepts. And the second thing we do is try to help some biologists, some willing scientists to think about some theoretical frameworks. This is very important to emphasize that because very often when we speak in front of scientists, the scientists can react quite negatively by saying, oh, who, who are you? Who do you think you are? You don't do experiments, which is perfectly true. You think you're gonna explain to us what's going on in our fields. And of course, this is not the aim. The aim is just to try to work again in close collaboration to end up with this more, we hope, precise 
uh, conclusions about concepts and theories. That's, that's the aim of philosophy of energy. So if you feel addressed, you can address me, but I'm just saying this is the kind of things we're trying to do. And this is especially the kind of things I've been trying to do since I'm in Bordeaux. So I was, I was an associate professor in the philosophy department at the Sorbonne. Not much of biology there, to be honest. And I switched and I went to uh, the immunology lab in Bordeaux, where I have a group during doing conceptual immunology. I will tell you about that. And, and there I can interact on a daily basis with people doing experiments. And that's exactly what I wanted. So, um, are we all, sorry, I forgot to say that my topic was are we all ecosystems, how my interactions, <laughs> development, and immunity. Okay, so I want to start with a very general problem. That very general problem uh, has to do with development. What do we consider as development? And I think that there's a traditional view of development that is still widespread um, that insists on the fact that development is to a large extent autonomous and also limited in time. But I think that in the last 15 years, many experimental data, in particular about microbe-induced development, have cast doubt on this traditional view of development. And this is what I want to talk about today. And mainly I think that for many of us, when we think about development, we often think about organogenesis, creation of new organs. And I think that the recent demonstration that very often microbes are involved in organogenesis is probably the best way to convince people that microbes are involved in development in general. So I'm going to insist on the role of some microbes uh, in cell differentiation and organogenesis. And what I want to do is to show that this uh, recent changes has some uh, consequences on more conceptual questions. I think it changes our conception of development I think it calls for interdisciplinary work at the interface of you know, all these sciences. And one of the things that we philosophers of biology, again, very modestly, try to do is to connect different fields together. Because our conviction is that for very good reasons, scientists are specialized, they need to be specialized. But at some point, it's very interesting and very often very informative go to other fields and see what's going on there and maybe be inspired by that to do your own research. Third, how it changes our conception of biological individuality. And fourth, I will draw a few <coughs> therapeutic uh, consequences of this change of view that uh, I, I mentioned. So for the few philosophers in the room, maybe there's no one, but we all philosophers uh, in uh, one sense or another, I want to insist that the, the problem I have in mind is I think a very general problem a problem for philosophy since antiquity. And I just took one example of a very famous German philosopher called Leibniz. And Leibniz, in his letters to Arnaud, says something about what it means for something to be a unit or a community. And he takes several examples, uh, in particular having to do with marble and then with a lake, as you can see here. And he says that there's as much difference between a substance and an entity like that, so a collective entity, as there is uh, between a man and a community. And I think that Leibniz was also very well aware that in one sense, every unit in nature is also a community. And I think there's a major question for all biologists and all philosophers, which is that all the entities on which you work as biologists are to some extent communities. But they are also units to different degrees. And I think that one of the main aims of philosophy of biology and biology together would <coughs> be to explain what are the criteria that will make move, what make you move from a community that is very community-like and a community that is more unified, that has, has a stronger unit. And this has many consequences about the evolution, the emergence of uh, multicellularity, for example, but also everyday work in the lab. Am I working on a mouse or an ecosystemic mouse? And what does it mean exactly? That's the kind of question I want to, I want to raise. So if you have a look at this, it's not very clear, very precise, just one representation and one expression that Leibniz would have loved. And Leibniz thought exactly that way. So this is a paper by uh, Lee and Gordon Steam, and, and they say words within words about the evolution of vertebrate gut mi microbiota. And I think this is exactly the kind of questions that Leibniz had in mind. When do you have a community? When do you have something like a <coughs> unit uh, or unity made on the basis of that community? 
So the particle world is made of communities, but the degree of unity of these communities changes. What are the mechanisms that ensure this unification of a plurality? And one thing I want to defend is that the immune system is one of the key mechanisms involved in this unification of a plurality. So there is a plurality, but the immune system plays a role in unifying that into a cohesive whole. This is what I'm going to defend. So do not be too much worried about the number of sections. It will be very quick. Traditional view of development, then how the microbiota induces development in plants, in mammals, how the microbiota influences the continuous construction of the brain, a new interpretation of the role of the immune system in the maintenance of the organism. This is where I'm going to explain why I think that the immune system plays a decisive role in this unification process that I just described. And I will explain that also in this sixth part and then move to a few therapeutic consequences. So of course, I'm a specialist of nothing of any of those topics. So again, just be aware that the things I'm going to describe are general, but I'm trying to put them together to end up with a this kind of big picture about what <coughs> a biological unit is or what a biological individual is. So that's my main philosophical and I think biological questions. So many of the things I'm going to present today are related to my project. So thank you for very much for the people who circulated the information about the postdocs. I'm still trying to find postdocs. So one of the reasons why I'm here today is to try to attract people to Bordeaux. Bordeaux is very beautiful, it's very cool. We have a great group where you can do whatever you want, experiments, conceptual questions, etc., etc. And we have this uh, group of uh, philosophers and biologists working specifically on the microbiota. And I really want some people, uh, experimental people, uh, to join us and do some experiments and conceptual reflection with us. And for, you know, until now, it's been difficult. It's very difficult, and I can perfectly understand that, for a biologist to go to a group led by a philosopher and say, oh yeah, cool, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that, we'll see what happens. So of course, this is not the kind of thing that happens very often, but I think it can be nice to come to a group like that and maybe to publish together in scientific journals, which can sometimes be interested in conceptual questions. So this is the people I've been interacted with, uh, including Gerard and Margaret. They're both, both here today, a, a, a very nice surprise for me. Uh, uh, and, and we really want to have these interactions with uh, experimental uh, biologists. So the traditional view of development. So what I'm going to say here is of course kind of a caricature, but I'm going to explain in detail why this caricature is important to understand what I'm going to talk about later. So I think that there's a, a view of development that is very widespread or was widespread that consists in saying that development is to a large extent the result of the unfolding of pre-existing the pre-existing form or pre-existing capacities. If you have a look at the genetic program of development, this idea or metaphor that was so strong in the 1960s, you'll see that a key aspect of that is precisely to say that, of course, the environment plays an important role, but the environment is permissive. The environment is something that, if it is completely normal, then the genetic blueprint that is inside the DNA will be expressed and you will end up with the normal developmental result, which is the normal form expected from a given species, for example. In that kind of view, only cell cells interact in development. The environment is important, but it's a background condition. And development is to a large extent autonomous, strongly deterministic, and limited in time. So you start with an egg cell, then there are divisions of cells, and then you end up with a human being. And that's you know, a very endogenous and autonomous process. One of the big stars of France, well, many of the big stars of France, and especially of uh, this institute and around this institute, were pretty much involved in that kind of views. And they were very influential from that point of view, very important speakers, thinkers about that, especially uh, those two, François Jacob and Jacques Monod. Jacques Monod writes uh, in uh, his book, uh, that Chance and Necessity, uh, 1970, translated immediately in 1970, a living being structure owes almost nothing to the action of outside forces, but everything from its overall shape down to its tiniest details to morphogenetic interactions within the object itself. It is thus a structure giving proof of an autonomous determinism, precise, rigorous, implying virtually total freedom with respect sorry, to outside agents or conditions, which are capable to be sure of impeding this development, but not of governing or guiding it, not of prescribing its organizational scheme to the living object. So that's a view that insists very strongly on this autonomous determinism in development. 
What about today? I think nobody today would say exactly the same kind of things. What I do think, nonetheless, is that internalism and the generic program view are still alive. One example is Eric Davidson, who died recently, uh, who wrote in 2006, development is the execution of the genetic program for construction of a given species or organism. And more generally, I think it's very fair to say that even for people who do not believe exactly in internalism and, and the genetic program, for many people then, I think it's fair to say that environmental influences on development have been largely neglected. And I think there are very good reasons for that. It's very difficult, uh, I learned, uh, to uh, really, in the lab, try to influence environmental aspects. So most of the time what people always say is that they would just bracket, or bracket to some extent, the environmental influences because it's much <coughs> better, much easier to do their research. I think that's a perfectly good reason, practical reasons. At the same time, I think that there was some sort of um, maybe vicious circle in which people decided to focus on um, traits that were not strongly influenced by the environment and then said, okay, this is a proof that development is not strongly influenced by the environment. So there was a choice made that had some consequences on our conception of development. So it's been documented in the last 25 years or so that there are in fact, of course, many different types of environmental influences on <coughs> development. And some of them, in fact, are much older. Some influences have been known for many centuries, uh, including the influence of temperature and site determination in some reptiles, for example. But some of them are more recent, like diet-induced polyphenisms, predator-induced polyphenisms, many examples of that, Daphnia, et cetera, et cetera. And here I want to focus on one example, uh, which is an example of microbe-induced development. I think this is a very recent and exciting area, mainly the last 15 years or so, let's say. Uh, for philosophy, it's very recent. For science, it's a little bit different. But I think this is very clear that it's a very dynamic uh, domain of biology with important consequences for science, philosophy, and medicine. And here I'm going to focus on mutualistic microbes mainly. So we all know that there's a gradient from parasitism to mutualism. It's very rare to say that something is purely mutualistic, pure, purely parasitic. That being said, the examples I'm going to give are examples where you have a development which is dependent on microbes. And those microbes are fairly reliably mutualistic, as you will see. So, by which I mean that there's a double contribution of fitness, contribution of fitness both to the host and to the, uh, microbi to, to the microbes, very generally defined. I think that this book by uh, Gilbert and Apple, uh, second edition 2015, uh, are a must read for, in fact, any biologist. Uh, many of you probably know this book, but I think it was great to write a textbook uh, to describe this field as early as 2009 and have a second edition uh, <coughs> last year. Uh, and it's full of examples where you can have these uh, strong environmental influences on developmental uh, mechanisms or aspects. So how the microbiota induces development in plants? I know not so many people are interested in plants, maybe they are in this room. In immunology, I think that it would be crucial to have a look at plants, but immunologists most of the time don't have time, don't want to pay too much attention, but sometimes it's great to have a look at a different model and see what's going on there. <laughs> and I think, again, in the case of uh, microbe-induced development, plants constitute a wonderful example, in fact, a series of examples. So there are two very well documented cases of mutualistic microbe-induced development, so meaning development induced by mutualistic microbes in plants. One is plants and uh, buscular mycorrhizal fungi, and the second is legumes and nitrogen fixi fixing sorry, resorbial bacteria. And I'm going to focus on the second one. So we know that uh, nitrogen is very important for life in general, and we also know that uh, neither uh, free-living rhizobia nor uh, uninfected legume plants can fix nitrogen. They must be in symbiotic association to do so. It's important to realize that this association is horizontal, it's acquired again and again at each generation. It is evolutionary ancient, at least 70 million years ago. Uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it appeared at least 70 million years ago. Mm -hmm. It is very widespread, it is very stable, and it is mutualistic. And I want to suggest that it is a very clear case of an organogenesis that is induced by microbes. So here is very roughly how it works, the nodule formation. Oh, I forgot to say that the organ in question is the nodule, and I think that it is very 
uh, clear that the formation of nodules is dependent on bacteria and is an illustration of microbe induced organisms. <coughs> so the root here uh, secretes some flavonoids. Those flavonoids are going to interact with the bacteria here, the rhizobia. The rhizobia recognize the flavonoids. In turn, they secrete the factor called not factor for nodulation factor. This will uh, lead to this, uh, the, the root hair to curl around these bacteria, and then the bacteria will enter into the root and even into, inter, inter, into the root cells, and then there will be many, many changes. The bacteria will activate some genes of the plants. They uh, will induce a, a very rapid uh, mitosis, so a cellular division, and this is this cellular division that will lead to the nodule formation. So for the formation of nodule, it's absolutely indispensable to have this interaction with rhizobia bacteria. In turn, the bacteria changes very, change very significantly. They develop, so to speak. They change considerably and become bacteroid. And this is this association itself that will be uh, in a situation to create the nitrogen that is so important for this interaction. I, I think it is very clear that this is an example of bacteria-induced development. There is clearly some sort of organogenesis going there. The nodule constitutes a bacterium-induced organ. Its formation, as I said, necessitates bacteria. It's also a bacterial organ in the sense that it contains bacteria. And what is extremely important for me is that it is as if the host plant wanted that bacteria or those bacteria. Of course, it doesn't want anything. I'm just saying that there's a very specific interaction that is going on there, and it, it's crucial to understand the other examples I'm going to give. There is an active attraction and selection of the bacteria by the host plant, and we know now that there is an active tolerance by the immune system of these specific bacteria. I think this, so sorry, Margaret, uh, mm -hmm. old picture, uh, but this nice picture it. too, and uh, <laughs> this is, I think, reminiscent of the now classic, at least, I believe, classic example of the squid vibrio association. I think that led many people to that field of microbe-induced development. I think, you know, to a large extent. So I cited some of the later papers, but some of them uh, are 1991, I think, published 1991. Uh, so, you know, it was really a very clear example where you have an animal, and of course, right, you know, many people are more sensitive to uh, examples taken from animals than plants, but where you can very clearly show that there is an organogenesis, in that case the organogenesis of a live organ of this uh, very cute squid, uh, that is dependent on a specific bacteria, in that case Vibrio fischeri. So this is an example of bacteria-dependent organogenesis, there is an active attraction and selection of this specific bacterium, so this has been also shown by uh, Margaret's team, uh, the very specific role of the immune system in these uh, processes of tolerance. And I think that was probably, you know, the main example for many people. What I'm trying to do now is to say the same kind of things are going on in many examples in plants. And clearly the same kind of things is going on in other invertebrates. Here's another example of the tube worm, I'm not going to detail this, but the prophosome, the digestive organ of these tube worms, is in fact a bacterial and bacteria-induced organ. I think there are many examples of that kind in nature. Microbe-induced development, and in particular microbe-induced organogenesis, is frequent in plants and invertebrates. In each case, the host actively attracts and selects specific bacteria and triggers a tolerogenic immune response to these specific bacteria. And I think legume rhizobia association offers a particularly clear case and one very widespread in nature. It's everywhere, the example of the uh, legume rhizobia that they took. And if you add the other example having to do with uh, mycorrhizal uh, fungi, then you see that it's something that happens all the time. You know, some people to Margaret can say, oh, your squid is fabulous, but this is a very specific example. What I'm trying to show today is that it's everywhere, in fact. It's a great example, but it's everywhere. What about us, mammals? I think we should not pay too much attention to us and to mammals, but I think we still want to know a little bit about us in that kind of situation and that kind of, with regard to that kind of question. And what I'm going to suggest is that it does exist in mammals. This kind of uh, microbe-induced development, even organogenesis, exists in mammals, even though 
not as clearly and not to the same to the same degree as in the uh, examples of invertebrates and plants that I just took. So how the microbiota induces development in mammals? So the first thing to say is that it is very clear that each of us is a complex microbial ecosystem made of many biotic elements belonging to different species, even in fact to different kingdoms. Uh, we have a huge number of bacteria that live in or on us, as you probably all know, uh, there are recent uh, re-evaluations of the number of bacteria in our bodies. I'm not so sure first that these evaluations are completely accurate. Uh, so it would be more like one to one instead of 10 to one as has been said for, for years. I'm not so sure it's, it's very solid. And anyway, I don't think we should pay too much attention to the numbers. What I'm going to suggest is that what's very <laughs> important is functions. What does this uh, microbiota do in the body? That I think is much more important than the number. Anyway, we know that if you add uh, bacteria and, and fungi and viruses, we're full of those uh, very uh, foreign uh, microbes in and on us. So, uh, of course, in the gut, but also on all uh, body's interfaces, lungs, skin, sexual organs, etc., lungs, etc. All these are examples where uh, these interactions are very strong. So I think that what is very crucial is the physiological indispensability of the microbiota, or at least it's a series of physiological roles. What it does, we, we've, we've known for years that it's involved in digestion. We now know many more details about its involvement in metabolism, immunity, and development. Many people now say that it's a key organ of the body, if forgotten uh, organ of the body. Uh, very often the interactions with uh, those microbes is mutualistic, but not always. And these interactions can change. Of course, we know that if you move to somewhere else, if you're infected by a bug, then the equilibrium in your body can change, and something that was mutualistic <coughs> can become parasitic, for example. I think that this should be understood as the constant construction of an equilibrium between the uh, host immune system and uh, these uh, bacteria. And of course, the question for me is, which exactly is the role of the microbiota in development? Can we say, that there is a microbe-dependent organogenesis in mammals? Well, to some extent, I think we can. I think the microbiota is indispensable for a normal development, in particular in angiogenesis in the gut, the genesis of blood vessels, in organogenesis of the gut. So, you know, people here were uh, you know, strongly involved in that uh, uh, demonstration, in, in particular uh, Gerard's uh, team the maturation of the, also of the gut immune system. And we also know that germ-free mice have very significant developmental defects and their immune responses are strongly diminished. So that is the example of angiogenesis, the paper by Stappenbeck and colleagues uh, that I think was very influential in the literature, uh, which shows that you have here a capillary sorry, network of germ-free mice uh, uh, which is certainly reduced uh, in the case so, of germ-free mice. Here you have uh, the same mice 10 days after inoculation with normal gut bacteria. So you can see that the capillary network is completely different. And here, and it's an interesting situation, you add only one bug and you have an almost complete capillary formation. So that was in 2002. And as I said, a very important uh, demonstration. Another aspect which for me was extremely interesting and I, I wrote about that, I talked about that very often, but very quickly, uh, Gérard and uh, the people of his team, Gérard Hébert, sorry, and people of his team suggest that uh, ILF, so uh, uh, isolated lymphoid follicles, are inducible <coughs> tertiary lymphoid tissues. And what they say is that this is a form of organogenesis, or at least of tissue genesis, something like that, because we had a conversation with Gérard, is it an organ or not an organ? Can we call that organogenesis or tissue genesis or something like that? What is important is that it seems to be continuous and reversible organogenesis throughout life. And Gérard used this very tricky word, recapitulation of a fetal developmental pathway. The intestine might have maintained a unique fetal characteristic of lymphoid tissue development. I think that is very important. I think that it is very possible that some developmental-like mechanisms are kept throughout life and can be activated uh, with regard to our interactions with uh, some microbes. Maybe there's a modularity here that is crucial to development and that can be used to regulate our interaction with uh, some microbes. So that would be an example of a continuous microbe-induced organogenesis uh, in uh, mice and in mammals more generally. 
A recent example that I'm sure you've seen, uh, so last uh, month also in, in science, uh, by uh, competitors, I guess, of some of you uh, in, in, in Bern, but anyway, interesting. Uh, the maternal microbiota drives early postnatal innate immune development, and here they insist on the very important interactions that there are between, uh, in fact, some of the constituents of the mother and the fetus these interactions, probably through antibodies, but they're not entirely uh, clear about that, uh, these interactions lead to the pre-preparation, so to speak, of the immune system of the fetus to what they call here the tsunami of microbes that successively colonize the intestine. So this is an example where people every day, <coughs> I think in many labs, are interested in these interactions between development, the immune system, and how one can influence the other and how it works. There are, in fact, many other examples uh, 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 apart from those I mentioned, uh, including about uh, uh, mammals, invertebrates, plants, etc., uh, that are detailed, for example, in this uh, review. So now, how the microbiota influences continuous construct construction of the brain? Could the microbiota influence the brain and its development? I think this is a very exciting question but, 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 we need to be careful about that question. So many people in the last uh, five years or so, uh, and I know there's a program here at the Pasteur Institute uh, very interested in that kind of questions, and I really think it's a fascinating topic. You can imagine that as philosophers, we want to know more about that, you know. Are you going to demonstrate that those bugs can influence the way uh, we think, the way we can have emotion, you know, our moods? Is it possible that it could influence stress and how? Could it influence some uh, very complex diseases such, such as autism, for example? All that is very interesting for philosophers. I must say, though, that we philosophers tend to be a little bit careful about many of the <coughs> statements that have been made recently. We're careful just because we are in a wait and see situation. We're pretty sure that if the data are convincing, it's going to be absolutely great. So no strong skepticism. It's more that some people, including Kryan, have been extremely enthusiastic about their discoveries. And we're just waiting about what it means exactly. Do you find correlation or causation? What do you find exactly? Is it possible to explain a very complex disease such as autism, thanks to the microbiota? How? How it works? Is it the, you know, the gut-brain axis? How is it exactly done? That kind of question, I think, are crucial. And they're first and foremost scientific questions. And we philosophers are waiting to know more about that. I think there was this among others, of course, th th there was this remarkable work by uh, Masmanian's team about the model of autism in mice in 2013, yes. But again, I think it's very important to remain cautious about that kind of examples. I just wanted to say that if, if uh, that research continues, it might be another illustration of the fact that microbes might be induced in development. So in that case, in the maturation of the central nervous system. I'm absolutely not sure about what I'm saying here. I'm just saying that some recent papers have insisted on the fact that the host microbiota constantly controls maturation and function of microglia in the CNS, so the, the macrophages of the, of the CNS. And I was just thinking, you know, really sp speculating that the, it is here that the microbiota influences cell metastasis, maturation and function in the brain. We also know that these cells are distinctly involved in the initial and continuous development of the brain. Maybe, so I say here very likely, I should not say very likely, I should say maybe the microbiota participates in the continuous construction of the brain through these interactions. So just imagine that maybe the microbiota has some influence on the microglia all the time, continuously, and these microglia play a key role in the constant maturation and development of the uh, CNS, then it would be you know, something quite great. And it would also mean that we should probably uh, be very careful about the distinction between development and post-development. When do you switch from development to something else? This is a key question for us philosophers of, of biology. I think it's also a key question for uh, many people working on, for example, uh, gut epithelia or that kind of you know, examples, where it's very difficult to say when you move from something which is developmental to something that could be just homeostasis or physiology or whatever. I think that, is, that could be a great example of that difficulty to draw boundaries. So the consequence of what has been said up to now is that the influence of mutualistic microbes on developmental, of development, sorry, is ubiquitous in nature, maybe not ubiquitous, but many examples of that, let's say. 
the construction of the organism via developmental uh, symbiosis uh, can be uh, uh, emphasized. So this is really uh, a construction <coughs> of the organism. It's very development or construction. Sometimes we can even talk about co-development in the sense that the microbes also undergo some sort of development. And we also know that the, uh, the, some of the, these microbes have a key influence on host physiology. And I think this led some people to uh, talk about the microbiota revolution. And many examples of that. Um, Margaret is a little bit everywhere here, sorry about that. Uh, uh, here with Thomas Bosch, uh, here Microbial Revolution by Blazer. Uh, other people were more focused on the whole of bions, so whole of bions which is more an evolutionary uh, notion. And I think that it is absolutely true that something very important is going on. I think that some people exaggerate the revolutionary nature of what's going on now on two grounds. One is about holobionts. I think we should be very, very careful about this idea that is now a little bit everywhere in the literature that the host and its micro, my, microbes sorry, constitutes a unit of selection. That is a very complicated debate. It's, it's, not, it's clearly not true that every association of a host and its microbes uh, is going to be a unit of selection. So I think this concept of holobion should be uh, taken carefully, even though it's extremely interesting. The second point is that many people emphasize that thanks to the microbiota, we're going to cure many complex diseases. And that, so autism, cancer, and many others. I think that, again, is something with which we should all be very careful. Still, I think this is really something crucial that is going on now in the last maybe 10 years about uh, the, the examples I gave of this importance of microbes, including importance of microbes on, for, for development. So I think that it changes many aspects of our uh, conceptions in biology. First, it changes, as I said, our conception of development, because I think it's clear that development cannot be defined as autonomous as it used to be. It's clearly more contingent, maybe more lifelong, than we used to believe. I think it also uh, forces people to think out of traditional divisions and disciplines <coughs> and even into systems. And this is something I'm going to say uh, in a few words about. And then I'm going to draw some consequences about biological individuality and then you know, very quick consequences about therapeutic uh, strategies. So a new interpretation of the role of the immune system in the maintenance of the organism. So it's been many years uh, that I've been convinced that the immune system is not primarily about defense. So I know some people will say, oh, sure. And others will say, oh, that's completely crazy. Sure, the immune system is about defense. So what I'm saying is a little bit different. What I'm saying is that we tend to focus on the immune system as a defense mechanism and to think about the evolution of the immune system from the point of view of defense. I think defense is one important function of the immune system among others. And I think if we really want to understand the immune system and its evolution, we need to think that in addition to this function in defense, the immune system has other functions. I think the immune system is involved decisively in the construction of the organism, in the maintenance of the organism, in the repair of the organism, and I think that interactions with microbes are likely to be crucial for all these mechanisms, for defense, for construction, maintenance, and repair. And I think very often, the immune system meets microbes all the time, every day, every second, every minute. And most of the time, the interactions the immune system has with these microbes are of a mutualistic or neutral uh, nature. And sometimes, but only a very, very small proportion of the time, sometimes the immune system sees microbes that are pathogenic. And in that case, you know, the immune system can say, oh, what are you doing here? You know, I'm going to destroy you. This is something that the immune system does. But I think this is a minor, not minor because it would not be important. It's a statistically minor function of the immune system. Every day, our immune systems do some repair, do some construction, etc., etc. And sometimes they do a little bit of defense against uh, pathogenic microbes. And of course, 